Great, and welcome everybody to the Wednesday, December 7th, 2022 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. This is our big one where we deliberate for uh, however long it takes, perhaps, or not. We could always meet in two weeks. We have 12 projects before us, totaling $1.496 million. Oh, good. Here comes Jeff. Um, so we have our work cut out for us tonight. And that is the one thing on the agenda, which is our deliberations on these 12 proposals. Keeping in mind, we've already funded three this cycle, the uh, St. John Canyon Church, the Canal Greenway Wall, and the small grant for Historic Northampton for Parsons. So I believe this will be our biggest round ever in terms of funding. So that's that's pretty exciting. As we always do, we start off with public comment. Is there anybody out there who would like to speak on behalf of anything CPC related? Now is your chance. Seeing no hands or no folks waving, we will move along. We have, I believe, only one set of minutes to uh, approve, and that is the minutes of September 28th that Sarah sent out to us. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? I had an amendment or a, I, I was at that meeting, Sarah, and I was marked as absent. Up, Sarah, Sorry about you that, are... Jen. I will make that change. Great. Right now. Thank you, Jen. Uh, is then, there? I'll move to approve. Great. And a second? I second. I'll second. Great. Thank you. There's Martha and Jonah. Um, any discussion on the minutes of September the 28th? Uh, Sarah, I'm going to take us through a roll call. Sure. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Here. Uh, Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Very unanimous. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. Thank you, Sarah, for getting those out to us. Uh, there is no chair's report. In the interest of time, we'll whip through that and move right on to the financial report. Sarah sent us an updated one uh, a couple of days ago, I believe. Well, Sarah, you want to go through that and explain what the, how it's different from the last one you sent sure. us? Sure. Uh, so we received our initial um, state match from the Department of Revenue. And it, we didn't get the extra distribution from the uh, budget surplus from last year. So that's been deducted um, from the available amount to spend, at least for this round. If it comes in um, in between this round and the next round, it will be available for spending. But just to make sure we didn't go over, I wanted to make sure that was reflected. So can you reiterate the bottom line to us, Sarah? So bottom line is... Let me pull it out. Um, So we have a total of uh, just about 1.6 million available for the remainder of the fiscal year. And there is 1.496 in uh, project requests before you this round. So if we were to fully fund all of the projects, we would um, be left with a little over $100,000 for the spring round. Correct, uh, with the addition of up to maybe about 130,000 coming in from that state budget surplus. So something will come in, you just don't know what it is. Correct. We don't know how much and we don't know when. Questions for Sarah about the finances? Um, this isn't a question per se, but it's just sort of a restatement of the obvious. So um, at our last meeting, we were working with a, uh, a cushion of about, um, if memory serves, about it was over three hundred thousand. So that's pretty much, you know, been significantly reduced. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, 
Beth? Uh, another newcomer question. Um, for purposes of the spring round next year, when do you see additional uh, funding come in and be available? Uh, so unfortunately, we don't know exactly when this will be received from the state. It's always a little bit of a surprise as to when the state match comes in. And unfortunately, especially with the this particular type of distribution from the, the surplus state budget from the previous yep. fiscal year, we don't know exactly how much it will be. Um, it it could be up to the amount that I had listed there, about 130000 It could be less than that. Um, I would anticipate about 100000 realistically. Um, do you have any convention about how much money you like to keep on hand uh, for, you know, surprise proposals, compelling things to do? I think that piece is part of the discussion. Okay. It's it's sort of up to the up to the committee as to what they feel like doing moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Looking into your crystal ball, Sarah, is there any projects that you see coming forward in for the spring? Uh, there is a Valley Community Development proposal that I know is coming forward soon for uh, housing development on Laurel Street. I don't know if they're ready to come in the spring round or if that will be waiting till next fall. But that's the only one I'm aware of at this point. And projects are due, project summaries are due to you when? Uh, those will be due mid January. Yes, yeah, so there's still another five, five weeks. Something like that. Any other questions for Sarah regarding finances? Okay, I want to see if I can show my face here. Is, uh, is it still, is it sounding okay? Yeah, it is. Um, and Brian, it looks like Jonah has his hand up also. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about this, uh, all this news about the resiliency hub. Is that something that we're going to receive a request for in probably next fall or in the spring, possibly? Uh, potentially, but also maybe not. Uh, that would need to come in as a historic preservation project because it doesn't include in a housing element that would be eligible for CPA funding. Right, right. Um, so not known at this point. I see. Okay. You indicated, Sarah, that it's in really good shape, the building. Is that correct? It is, yeah. Uh, you know, there's still due diligence to be done, um, but it, it has been well maintained and it's in good shape in the interior as well. That's exciting, exciting news. Uh, any other questions for Sarah regarding finances? Good to go. All right, so here we go. We have 12 projects in front of us. Um, and Sarah and I were talking this er earlier today, or was it yesterday, um, about how to structure this. And um, for folks like me, my brain starts to overload after uh, later into the evening. So what, what we were thinking is to start off with ones that perhaps uh, took a little more uh, brain work, or at least I and Sarah thought they might take a little more brain work and leave the ones that um, were perhaps less involved or intricate or at least confusing until the end when we could um, have solved all of the all of the problems of, of, of the first ones. So there are a couple that stood out, at least for me, as warrant of, um, of being pushed to the front. And then I think would op be open to suggestions from other folks in terms of how we want to proceed. Um, the way I'm looking at Bev and at Joan on this one, but the way we've done it in the past, and it seems to have somewhat worked, is that to sort of do a first round where we look at the projects, we discuss them, then someone makes a motion to put them in the shopping cart. So here we are in the grocery store of wonderful projects. Putting it in the shopping cart doesn't mean that we are checking them out. It just means that they are in the shopping cart and we like what we've seen so far, but we don't know what else is gonna go in the shopping cart nor how much we're going to be spending. So once we go through all the projects, we put them in the shopping cart. Then at that point, we step to the checkout line and review them all 
And it may not be discussing them. It may be a quick thing, but it gives us a chance to go over them one more time and maybe tweak the amount of money um, or not. And again, to reiterate uh, for Beth and Jonah, but for, I'm sorry, Bev and Jonah, but for all of us, um, we are not the funding body, we are the recommending body. It is uh, city council who does the actual funding. We have three uh, things that we can do. We can recommend funding at the full level, we can re recommend funding at a partial level, or we can recommend not funding at all. Uh, city council cannot go back to projects that we have decided not to fund and bring them back up. City council can look at projects that we've decided to fund and not fund them, although they are very, very reluctant to do that uh, because they have great confidence, thankfully, in the, in the good work that all of you and us do. The two projects that, that stood out to Sarah and I as, uh, as perhaps starting off our discussion is one, the Community Investment Fund, it's $100,000. Uh, and the second was Smith Charities, that was the $349,218 one. So those two as, as, uh, as perhaps Deserving or not deserving is a wrong word. Um, requiring, no, that's wrong too. Maybe having more discussion of those two. Are there other projects that people want to move to the front? Are are people good with Community Investment Fund and Smith Charities being on the top there? Yes. Okay. Other projects that you that that we want to push to the front? Nothing. Um, that, uh, Bev. Uh, yeah, again, I'm I'm learning. Um, I, I understand that the funding request is not significant, but the DAR proposal, I'd love to hear people talk about the extent to which it aligns satisfactorily with uh, priorities for funding. I had that third on my list, uh, oh, okay. so let's let's leave that there, perhaps. Sure. What else? That's it for me. Okay. Anybody with any other requests to move projects to the front? Okay. Uh, Bev, was that another hand or are you? No, nope, I'm just looking for the lower. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's begin with discussion of the community investment uh, fund. So again, it's on the table for $100,000. I thought we would not make a motion to put it in the shopping cart until after we've had some discussion. So somebody want to begin with their thoughts, feelings about the Community Investment Fund. Jeff. Um, I'll start this one off. Um, in, in general terms, um, I support the proposal. I think um, it's an alternative proposal. And I think this group does a lot of good work with regards to affordable housing. And I think the city of Northampton does a lot of good work overall, but um, the reality is um, altogether, we're not keeping up with um, where we need to be <clears throat> with regard to affordable housing and this proposal thinks outside the box um, in terms of trying to deal with the problem and, and they're asking for a loan. Um, and this proposal has the, the uh, potential to um, regenerate itself, to expand upon the initial um, proposal that they're putting forth to, um, to grow. And I think it has, um, <clears throat> I had to, it took me some time to can't come to this position because I originally was thinking um, it's a little more complicated um, than what I initially thought, but I think, I think it can work. And um, I see the problem as a as, um, housing authority board member, um, <clears throat> we're essentially playing defense, um, trying to keep 
things in place that we already have and keep them up to code and scale and um, and try to expand with our Section 8 uh, vouchers and whatnot. But um, this is a this is kind of opening up a different front on the, the issue of affordable housing. And so um, I am supportive of this proposal. I'll leave it there. Thanks for starting us off, Jeff. Other folks? Jonah? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Jeff. Um, I reading through it in detail a second time and doing some background reading on these kind of endeavors. It seems like a worthwhile novel approach that we should support. Uh, my only question about it, and, and maybe this was addressed when we met with her, maybe others have memories of conversations you've had. I don't know, Sarah, you remember, but it, would we play any kind of monitoring role in, 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 the, in the workings of this, or we would give the loan and be out of it and assume we'd get it back in, in whatever time frame, and, and it would be up to them and their partnership with um, Valley CDC or Wayfinders to kind of make this work? There would be no supervision or monitoring of them, I assume, right? Just because I just, you know, we, uh, whatever, it feels a little risky. Will they find the right property? Who will the tenant be, et cetera, et cetera? Sarah, you want to respond to that? Yeah, and the application didn't propose um, monitoring on the part of the city. Um, it it seemed like there were a few different methodologies that potentially could be used to both to screen potential um, renters and homeowners, um, but they hadn't decided on a final layout of what that would look like. Beth? Uh, yeah, I just want to agree with um, what everyone has said. I, I struggled with this and I realized that I had been wearing my uh, ex-developer's hat when I was doing the struggling um, because it's not clear to me what the feasibility is. But I don't think that's our judgment. I think as others have said, I think what's important is that this is a very um, sort of uh, complex topic that a lot of people are trying to figure out. Um, and I did a, a little reading as, as well. And, you know, some estimates say that as much as 68% of the total stock of affordable housing in New England is in this group. And how do we make sure it doesn't go away? So for me, I think that the learning that can come from their demonstration, as I think they called it, uh, is really important. And so I, I agree that it would be a tough role for us to quote unquote monitor, but I would love to see us be able to benefit from the learning. And I frankly think that the outcome of home ownership is less important than the outcome of preservation, whether it's rental or home ownership. Um, and again, so all the variables that go into which way it works and how it works best and what it really costs, um, I, I personally would be very interested in um, learning more about that and, and think that's good reason enough to, to invest. Jeff? Oh, you're muted, Jeff. Unmute. Unmute, sorry. Um, just to follow up with the questions about um, monitoring, in their proposal, there was a um, and I don't want to get into, you know, conditions, but there, there was a, um, the nonprofit has to be formed, the LLC has to be formed, and then later on it talks about an advisory board. And I was thinking we might want to have a discussion about um, whether we, we could have an advisory board position or appointment on However, that forms up, you know, when that, whenever that happens, as a as a way to monitor and see how this actually plays out. Assuming it's not illegal, Sarah, which I don't think that would be. 
Uh, uh, Jeff and others, I, I do think this is the time that we can talk about conditions. And it's <clears throat> probably best to do it now while it's fresh. So as things come up, like Jeff just said, whether it's a LLC, whether it's an advisory committee, those, those are things we should be thinking about now. Uh, Chris? Thanks. Um, I want to respond directly and then have a general comment um, to Jonah. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure I fully understand exa what you're saying, but just um, as as a point of uh, information, the CPC uh, doesn't act as a monitoring entity. Uh, we recommend financing. We learn from the experiences of past grants if they're approved, uh, but we're not directly involved in oversight. And Sarah mentioned this when she said, you know, how the city might do it, um, but we would not, um, we're, we're not, we're not charged with, nor do I think we're capable of performing that function. Um, I am intrigued, however, by Jeff's suggestion that maybe a CPC member might be included in whatever um entity they create um as a monitor to go forward but but again cpc doesn't do that um at least not in my experience um on the project itself um i have to confess to feeling not nearly smart enough to make an informed decision so i'm looking forward to hearing what my uh colleagues particularly the ones with housing background have to say about it but as a general to, to the best of my ability to understand it um I'm excited by anything that brings a new mechanism to the toolbox of, of uh, uh, providing um, uh, affordable housing in this community because I think it's a I think it's a, a difficult a difficult situation for us and any 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 new input I think is welcome, uh, particularly in this case given my understanding which is I guess what Jeff was saying is that this isn't actually a grant so much as seed money on a loan uh, and not to not to sneeze at hundred thousand dollars, but it's not big big money. Uh, so even if they were to default, um, I, yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not feeling too terrible about that, given the fact that the potential return of creating a self-supporting entity that's going to, you know, make any contribution to dealing with affordable housing in this community, I think is worth 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 funding even if it is even if it is at something of a risk uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing what other people have to say about the specifics Martha uh, yes let me just lower my hand um, so I was not at the meeting on October 19th but I was able to actually look at the recording of it and Bev, I just wanted to say, I thought you had asked excellent questions at um, that for uh, especially a person just coming to the board, but also it's clear you're so knowledgeable and I really appreciated them. Thank you. I had a couple of questions that were more clarifications. Um, one is that it seemed that <clears throat> there was a very big ask to the ARPA fund <clears throat> and that at the time was not uh, confirmed that that would be coming through. I think it was 400 thousand dollars and I wondered if that had been <clears throat> decided upon yet and if not when that would be coming through Sarah do you know yeah so the city will be making decisions about the local ARPA requests in mid-January okay so um so I don't know how dependent on the six how dependent um on those funds are uh, for the success of this pilot but that would be just one question that um, I had. And then the second was, um, it, it didn't appear that there were going to be housing restriction, housing, affordable housing restrictions placed on these properties. Is that still true? Um, and so, you know, one way I was thinking about it, um, and maybe I'm misinterpreting is that if there are no restrictions placed on it, um, you know, eventually these units, let's say, would kind of come out of the affordable housing stock. So we would have less. Am I looking at that in, improperly? And so that was just a concern I wanted to raise. Um, but otherwise, I agree with everyone. I think that we have such a major problem statewide, nationwide, that any innovative tools that entities are willing to take a risk in trying, um, we should support. Other folks? 
Jen? Yeah, thank you. That was my question. And I thought that was something that was raised that you raised, Sarah, um, during the presentation um, day about it not having an affordability restriction and whether that would like whether its eligibility was actually like whether there was a question of its eligibility for CPA funding. Um, and I had I I'm still I'm really glad to hear everybody else's comments and this is not my area of expertise so I'm um, very open to everybody with more expertise as perspective. Um, and I also very much support alternative approaches and out of the box thinking. Um, but I also had the same sort of reservation about this is a one time affordability access point that then closes um, and it's providing it to future individuals, but only for the length of this tool existing and it's on a case by case basis it's not protecting that stock over time so I don't know that that fully tips the balance for me against supporting it but um but yeah I had that question about the affordability and the eligibility Sarah can you speak to that about um yeah are, are, um, are we still within our purview without an affordability housing restriction and it, it's a little challenging to know because we don't know exactly what the CPA funds are proposed to be used for. Um, so there, there are various ways that this could be structured to make it fit within the CPA allowable sort of affordable housing box. Um, but because we don't know what the direct expenses will be uh, or what the exact budget is, we don't really know what that will look like. So Danny had indicated that they're not planning to deed restrict either of the units, uh, but that they would take steps to make sure that the selected household is below 80% AMI when they enter the lease purchase program. And again, at the time of purchase. Um, and she also indicated that a, mor uh, uh, a mortgage held by the, the city to protect the CPA funds could potentially be a possibility, but we didn't have any final um, understanding of, uh, again, of what that would look like. Jen, any follow-up questions for Sarah? Uh, yeah, Jonah? I still, I, oh, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, and I can lower my hand. Um, yeah, so I, I still feel confused as to whether this is eligible. And I also, I echo what everyone else is saying of the risk of it as a loan feeling lower to me and sort of worth creating this new alternative method of um, offering the entry point of accessibility to housing. Um, but yeah, the eligibility is still a big question, I guess. Jonah? I just wanted to say, you know, I don't really know anything about the act, the nitty gritty of the restrictions that, you know, we're, we, we would be held to, but I just really admired her broader goal around wealth creation you know, using this kind of housing, which is such a traditional New England tool for families to build assets and, and making it accessible to people that right now don't really, or it's really hard to get access to that. And so, you know, the extent to which it plays a housing role, it also, play, you know, this not putting a deed restriction, in my opinion, plays such a an important social role. Anyway, she made a very good point of that. I'll, she spoke eloquently about that. In her, in her application and uh, when she spoke with us. That's all. Uh, Julia, comments? I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to hear from my colleagues. I, I'm intrigued by it. I'm excited by a new prospect. Um, but it's also not my my area and um trying yeah i'm still working on it <laughs> best i can say I'm really trying to understand what how, how this plays into our uh new preservation plans jenna yeah i think i want to echo what what most of my colleagues here have said and feeling like on the one hand this is intriguing and on the other hand I'm not totally sure 
I understand how it would work. And I have to say that looking at Sarah's draft council order of, you know, that the money would be awarded to a nonprofit yet to exist for purposes yet to be identified gave me pause. Um, I think a lot of new ideas probably look like that at the beginning. So again, that alone is not necessarily a reason not to do it. Um, and and yes, we we desperately need the housing. And even if it's just you know, for two families for a shorter period of time, that need is still there and that's still met for two families. So that alone may make it worthy, but it's, um, I wish I had a little bit more uh, surety and clarity around it. Julia? You know, I, I have been thinking, and, and when I, I reread this yesterday, I was thinking about, um, there is no nonprofit. There is no LLC. These are things that they plan to do. Could we stage the money or, or, or create some kind of a timeline for the disbursement of the money tied to their achieving some of the requirements to, to create this entity uh, as opposed to just say, here's the loan, go off and do it. And I'm not as convinced that one of us that 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 along with that timelining, the right thing would be for somebody from CPC to serve on their advisory board. Uh, but but certainly some reporting along the way would be appropriate for us. Yeah. Do folks. Uh... Maybe this is a question for Sarah. I feel we have the latitude to ask for some kind of um, use restriction or affordability restriction. I know this is a, a debatable topic. I, I can see both sides of it. But in my experience with other kinds of affordable home ownership, there's usually uh, a second mortgage created by the public funding that burns off within some period of time. The idea being that you don't want somebody to buy it and then whether through, you know, malintent or whatever, sell it at a big profit a year later and and there you go. What 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 have what have we done except, as you say, uh benefited a benefited a family. And the time periods that I've seen are, you know, typically around five years, seven years, maybe something like that. And so it's, you know, something that somebody would have to think through in the context of the finances of the project and think about the relative importance of our $100,000 relative to the total financing and all of that kind of stuff. So I don't have a specific proposal, but I, I, I do think it would be worth exploring. And I, I don't recall they're inviting um, some repayment mechanism for the loan, but it seems if there's any openness, we ought to, we ought to go there. Um, Bev, we can set conditions as long as they're reasonable uh, and within the, within our domain. And that's something we, we often do. And, and we've done that repeatedly with historic, with historic preservation is, you know, set up a historic preservation restriction and you have to go and go through the hurdles to do that. So we could, Certainly do this as well. And, I would and, like to to Brian, reiterate. I would just add also that the the CPC and City Council is constrained here by the parameters of the CPA legislation, so that if CPA funds are going to be used directly for acquisition of an affordable housing property, we're obligated by law to place an affordability restriction um, on that on that property. If CPA funds are going to be used for something else related to the creation of affordable housing, that's not strictly required, but has been done in some instances to be able to protect the city's investment. Um, probably the most complicated example of something like this was the Housing for Homeless Individuals project, where it was really clear that the, the applicant couldn't place an affordability restriction due to the complications of their private funding. So we worked a lot behind the scenes with the applicant after it passed city council to set up a mortgage and repayment structure that would make sense for them. Um, that's potentially something that we could do here. But again, we don't know exactly what the CPA funds will be used for. So it's hard to make those types of predictions about what would work and what wouldn't work. I, I thought in rereading the proposal that the 100,000 would go toward direct acquisition of a property. Is that not the case? 
that was what was initially proposed. Um, but I made it clear to Danny after that came in that that wouldn't be allowable. So she threw out some different ideas about what that could look like. CPA funds could potentially be used for repairs, legal fees, um, other expenditures. I suggested that perhaps it could even be used for uh, rent subsidies as a um, direct assistant to individuals. That's also allowable by the CPA. But again, we don't know exactly what the budget would be. So that would have to be a condition. So, so it cannot be used for direct acquisition of property, even with an affordable housing restriction. With an affordable housing restriction, that would that's fine. Um, but the the acquisition of the property using the CPA triggers that requirement for an affordability restriction. Right. Jen? Thank you. Uh, I just had a question for somebody that knows more about this. Maybe Bev, you kind of alluded to this and Sarah, but um, I would just like to understand a little bit better the mechanisms available for affordability restriction and like you're, the way you're speaking about a mortgage sounds like it can have a shorter term. So it's not a permanent affordability restriction. Um, I just like to understand that because I did, like Jonah was saying, it does seem like that sort of wealth, like the potential for wealth creation is inherent to the proposal. So a permanent affordability res restriction would counter that goal of kind of the structure. But if it's possible to kind of protect our investment in the shorter run and assure that it's not flipped and sold for two hundred thousand more dollars or whatever the thing is, um, I'd just be curious to know if, what those tools are a little bit clearer. Thank you. I think the way a mortgage is being discussed here would really just be to pr protect the city's investment. You know, if the project failed or if the housing was used for something other than uh, the affordable housing that it was intended to be used for, then the CPA could receive its funds back. Chris? Um, I'm, I actually see Bev's hand up, and if she wants to respond to Jen, I'm going to defer and let her do that and then circle back. Uh, sure, yeah, that was my intent. I'll do a quick response. Uh, I don't want to get into, you know, <laughs> affordable housing 101, but um, there have been programs mostly funded by the federal government over the years for affordable home ownership. Uh, the funds typically pay a big cost of producing the housing in the first place. And so if you put a soft second, meaning that it can't interfere with the collateral rights of the prime lender, um, and then you allow it to, quote, burn off, that means it's the par a part of the loan is forgiven for each and every year that the person stays in the housing. That loan, as a percentage of the total cost of owning the home, is significant enough that it would be hard for people to just buy it one year and sell it the next. Um, if they didn't have to pay off part of that loan, right? So it's not intended to be a big club. It is intended to encourage what I think the original purpose is, which is staying in the home, investing in it over time, raising your family in it, whatever it is you're gonna do, um, but gradually uh, earning equity in that home uh, by the forgiveness of the second mortgage. But again, that's why I said, if we're only talking about $100,000 divided by two homes, I don't know, I could go back and look at the math on each home to see whether that's a significant enough piece of the total cost of the home, the subsidy, if you will, um, to create the incentive that we're talking about, which is to stay there for some period of time. Uh, there are other models that restrict your ability to sell the home to anyone but another person in a similar income group. Um, that becomes much harder, right? Because um, you're potentially talking about having to find additional assets at the time of the sale if the person can't come up with a down payment or what have you. So again, it's not simple. I'm just, they're, they're smart and creative people and I'm wondering if it doesn't isn't worth asking them to come back with something that would speak to two issues. The potential of somebody, um, I hate to use this term, but this is really what it's about, flipping the home. Um, and um, increasing the likelihood that the investment of 
uh, CPA funds would be protected and ideally returned over time. Thanks, Beth. Chris? Thanks. Um, so I guess uh, first an observation and um, that is that, uh, you know, Jonah, Jonah was the first one to raise the idea of, uh, of, of wealth creation. And while I think that's a really intriguing idea, I have to ask myself, um, clearly CPC is in the business of, we're in the low income housing business, but are we in the wealth creation business? Um, so that's just something to, to chew on. And then the other thing to chew on um, is since I'm, I'm already beginning to lean this way is, and I don't remember at the time of their presentation, what did the, uh, did the applicants make any comment on what the impact of a delay in our decision might be? Sarah, I can you... respond to that because I watched the um, tape very recently. Uh, no, they did not. And that was actually one thought that I had um, following up on Chris is um, whether it would be who of us to ask them to reapply in the next round. Um, because we don't know about the status of the nonprofit, we don't know about the status of the ARPA funds. There are a lot of, I mean, hearing a lot of other questions that people have that um, leave us with a, um, some, a lot of uh, unresolved questions related to it. And I think it um, maybe giving it some more time and asking them to come back in the spring with these things worked out would assure us that our concerns would be met. I would like to echo what Martha just said. It it really concerned me when Sarah gave us the city council order, um, and a, you know a nonprofit yet to be formed, an advisory committee yet to be formed. CPC funds will be used for what exactly? Um, it, I think it's a it's a an amazing proposal that needs enough. Uh, needs a, a, some tweaking and some work for me to feel comfortable funding it at this time. Um, I'll be curious to know if they uh, do not get the ARPA funds, do they move ahead? Because that was four fifths of what their budget was, right? Or almost four fifths, 400,000, or 100,000. It was, I think, 50,000 in philanthropic contributions coming in. So that's a significant thing. The only thing that concerns me is would the 400,000 in ARPA be more likely to come in if we contributed our 100,000 first? And so it's like, oh, uh, well, we missed that opportunity. Um, but also we need to, I think, have some of these issues worked out and perhaps they can have them worked out by the time ARPA, you know, give them a month or a month and a week so they could sort of nudge them to go to um, ARPA and have a more coherent, not coherent, it's too strong of a word, but more concise proposal. So even with that um, hesitation, I think I would support what Martha said, which is offering encouragement and support, but uh, wanting to see a more refined proposal. Uh, Martha? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, not being familiar with the ARPA uh, decision-making process, and I don't know if anybody here can answer this, maybe Sarah, um, is matching funding for ARPA applications um, considered um, essential, a factor in decision-making? Does it not really matter? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I know decisions are being made entirely locally. Um, so this is, there's a group of, people reviewing the applications who will then pass those finalists on to the mayor for recommendation. But but I, I don't know what uh, what the parameters are that they're considering or, or whether a match would make it more likely to be funded or not. Other folks wanna weigh in on this? Chris. Just to, just to follow up on what Sarah just said, so if it's being if it's being managed locally, then our I'm not saying 
which our, I'll just say it, our willingness to indicate that we are generally supportive, but we're looking for a tighter proposal could have a beneficial impact on the ARPA decision-making process. Is that something that would be appropriate for us to pass on to ARPA, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can I can definitely find out a, a way to do that and get the message along. Uh, I don't know where where this proposal is in the in the process or whether it's being considered for final inclusion, uh, but and I can who, make sure that message is heard. Who is that considering uh, body for our? I I don't know entirely. I, it's a local entity. It's not like it's being reviewed at the federal level or anything like that. Further discussion on this one? So, uh, so as we decided the format, hopefully folks are okay with it, or, and if not, uh, we can discuss that right now. The process would be if we're done with discussion on this, then there would be a motion to put it Uh, Jen? Sorry, you froze for me for a second. Um, so I guess I just wanted to say personally that I do think with more detail, I would be in support of this project. But for me, that is, it's important that it's alone. And my memory of the initial discussion was that part of the reason it was proposed as a loan was um to sort of get around this affordable housing question so sort of if it was restructured as a grant i would have a little bit more concern about the lack of a longer term affordability restriction so i'm very much in support of what we're agreeing on and saying that we would in general be in favor of it as is but for me if it changed sort of structurally i would have to think about it a lot more so that's all Uh, would somebody, and any further discussion on this? Would somebody like to make a motion? So somebody, moved. thank you, Jen. Uh, Do we need a motion to put it in the shopping cart, Brian? I can't remember. I thought we we were doing that. Is that some refresh our memories here? Well, but, I but wait, a, I, I, do we have to put it in the shopping cart given where we've gone with this conversation? No. It seems to me so the that motion would be we, to not put it in the shopping cart. Okay, that that's that uh, that's yeah. so. Why would we move to not put it in the shopping cart? What we're what we're moving really is to not fund it and and that's why you know maybe we want to hold off on 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 that toward the end but it seems like what we're moving to do is not fund it and give the the applicant some advice some feedback you make so julie there's a motion there is that correct yeah i mean i moved to not fund it but and, and <laughs> to not fund it and to provide some advice and ask the applicant to re Tighten up, reapply. Not fund. All, the motion and, is to not fund. And also I mean, to express support to ARPA. Is that part of the motion as well? We do, we do, we, we as a group, we can give all this advice to Sarah, who will carry it out. But but as a group, we do one thing, we fund or not fund. So the motion is to not fund. Okay. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second, second that. Okay, a couple seconds, Chris and Bev, I believe. A third. Uh, Sarah, you want to <laughs> take us? So the motion on the table is to not to fund the uh, the first grant that we've looked at, um, which is the uh, community investment fund, but to uh, request that they come back to us with a more refined proposal. We had a second, Sarah, you can take us through a roll call on this. 
Sure. Jen? Yes. Jonah? No. Jeff? No. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, so that took an hour. We have 11 more to go. That would take us to about <laughs> seven in the morning. So, uh, moving right along, we have uh, Smith Charities coming up. Uh, 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 Smith Charities asked for 349,218 for uh, round two of their historic preservation. Let's begin discussion of that. Uh, Martha, can you want to start us off with that as our historic preservation person? Um, sure. Uh, we the historical commission did review this application back in the earlier fall, um, and you know, in general, we support this because this is such an important historic structure, uh, not only in the downtown for the downtown, but also um, for its designer and. Um, it just it's just a very fine example of the type of style of architecture it is. Um, and I guess I know that there was some concern about um, the repeated funding of this organization. We didn't talk about it that as a commission. Um, the, and I know that um, this is sort of phase two and there's likely to be a phase three that will be supposedly less costly. Um, so I think, um, my feeling, and the commission would agree, is that it's a very important structure to hold on to. But I think the question um, emerges about what the long-term financing for this is. Um, is this maintenance that is not being taken care of, which I don't believe is um, something that the CPC allows or CPA allows. Um, so that's where I come down on it. Other folks? Jeff? Um, yeah, I think in their, in the application, um, I think it's 399,000 and they're asking us for 349. And the other fundraising is a mere um, 50,000, um, I think from one source, I'm not, not quite sure, but, um, and that's not even going to be um, applied for until spring of next year, according to the application. So um, we funded this before, um, this is <coughs> phase two of a, three phase plan, I believe. Um, I kind of feel that there are, there are some things in the projected um, budget that are deemed urgent. And um, I'm in support of funding those. Um, I think it's three areas. Um, they have a list called uh, under scope of work, talks about um, the chimney, um, and a couple other things that escape me right now. But anyway, it comes, the amount comes out to 165,000 and change. Um, and that, that work is deemed urgent and uh, it is a beautiful building. And I'm in, I'm in favor of um, supporting that right now. And then we're gonna be dealing with this down the road. Um, we already have, and I think, I think in the future we will be again. So that's basically where I'm at at this point. Thanks, Jeff. Other folks? Um, Sarah, you expressed some concern about, so I, I think Jeff, you're right that there, there was one other source of funding and that was, I believe, 50,000 coming from Mass Historic Commission. They had already gotten a grant 
from them last year. Sarah, you expressed concern that that's a very competitive grant, that uh, it may not be forthcoming again this year. And there's, as Jeff pointed out, there's no other uh, um, ask that they have out there. Uh, the, the total available uh, for this round in the MPPF program is a million statewide. And they were asking for 50,000 of that. Okay. So when I was reading the proposal, Jeff, just to piggyback on what you said, um, they had sort of high, uh, extremely high priority, high priority, and not quite as high priority was a, was a third round, something like that. I got Jeff, when I, when I added up the, the extremely high priority, high priority, I came up with 199,425 as opposed to their ask of 349,000. You, you came up with 160,000. Was that just the, the highest of the high priorities? Muted again. It's been a long day, too many Zooms. Um, I took the, I think they were triple starred were the highest priority and I just took the, there were, I think there were three of them and I got 165,750. Okay, um, so that's, that's at the highest, highest of the high. Priority. Yeah, I that's figured that was like immediate um, work needed to be done. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It's uh, uh, chimney, uh, cornice, and uh, yeah. roof flashing. Cornice, yeah, I couldn't think of that. Yeah. yeah. Other folks want to speak to the Smith Charities one? Jen? Yeah, I'll just say very quickly, I, um, I'm totally in support of this proposal of kind of breaking it down into the high priority. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I had reservations about the full amount, um, but that feels like a doable compromise. Julia? Um, Jeff, I'm just trying to understand what we're saying. And I looked at it also, not only the high priorities, but the fact that they're asking for funding for what is their low estimate uh, and and they could be spending a whole lot more money. So what I'm trying to understand is are we just are we just kicking our own can down the down the road a little bit and saying, you know, we'll give you the money for your highest priority things. The next things will then become your highest priority things. So ask us again. And then the next things after that will become your highest priority things. Ask us again. And so we're just going to be looking at three grant applications as opposed to this singular. I do, though, agree that uh, the, 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 the they, it seems to me that they've done a very limited uh, ask for funding from from any, I mean, 50,000 from Mass Historical, which they may never see. That's a really limited ask for funding from other sources. So uh, it's it's hard to read as uh, as it's us or it's nothing. It's us at 350, which mm, if their high estimate comes in as as what they spend, they're 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 way off, and I don't know how they're gonna. I mean, not our issue, but they're not going to meet their need. And and again, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to imagine this. You know, how many times are we going to see this list of things that they need, or, or and 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 how many funding requests will we see out of this? So, Jonah. Yeah, I I, uh, I I'm I'm in agreement with everyone's impulse to not fund this fully. But I do know, remember that she when asked this question uh, last month, she specifically said that um, because of the nature of uh, retaining the contractor, building the scaffolding, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. And uh, and that if if they don't get the total package of funding, they're not going to they're just going to put it off down the road. Um, that, however, can't be the case with the internal work, the chimney work. And the roof re reinforcement work, those cross ties that need to be put in, um, that part of the work surely is not dependent on a scaffolding. So this chimney is central, so it doesn't need that external scaffolding. So um, 
certainly that work is reasonable to expect that they could do without say putting up the scaffolding and retaining the the uh, stone contractor. And I, I, I don't know, do you, does you guys remember, uh, we, I don't think we asked them this question last time. Have we, have they ever contributed any of their own capital or funding to these, these restoration projects in the past? Have we always been along with say this other kind of grant, the sole funders? I'm just, you know, I don't know what their endowment is, but it, it just seems wild that they take no fiscal responsibility for this building on their own. And they they ask us to bear uh, the entire burden. They've come to us once before, Jonah, and we were their sole source of funding, um, along I believe with that Mass Historic Commission grant. But there was no else other than that. There was nothing else. But they they also explained to us the nature of the uh, Smith Charities Endowment, and they don't really have you know. Again, this is their explanation, we didn't ask for a full budget to take a look at that endowment and, and how the funds are restricted. But the money from Smith Charities is not for the upkeep of the building. And and they, and they and most of that money is restricted to uh, Smith Folk, widows, um, the, the mortgage fund, I forget what it was. At least that's the way they explained it to us. So first time they came for funding, we did ask them about that. Other discussion about this? So their ask was, again, to reiterate, their ask was 349,218. If we were to fund their, just their three-star top priorities, that would come in at 165,000. If we funded their extremely prioritized and um, or extremely high priority and high priority, that would come in at 199,000. So it seems like we have four choices here, not to fund, to fund at the full ask, to fund at uh, the 199, to fund at the 165 or somewhere in between. Jana? I just wanna point out that at least the way that I read the budget, there is a an indicated design and engineering fee associated with those extremely high priority and high priority tasks. So if we're thinking about partially funding the high priority things, I think it makes sense to also consider whether or not we're covering that because if we're saying, okay, we're, we're willing to fund these, but not the design and engineering fee, we're still leaving them short at least $20,000. And that's again, if they come in the low estimate. So I, perhaps that's another proposal to look at that sort of total midway through the budget page, which is, 224, 483, or some subsection of that if we were only looking at the extremely high priority items there. So the way you're reading it is if we did the extremely high, we'd have to tack on another 20,000. Is that right, Jen? I, that's the way I read the budget, that they have this list at the top with a subtotal and then a design and engineering fee, and then this lower priority list at the bottom that has its own associated design and engineering fee. Um, so, uh, I actually, now that I look at it, it's, that's a little bit confusing, but yes, there, it, I could be misinterpreting it. Somebody tell me if you read this differently, but it, I read it as though that fee is associated with those high priority tasks leading to a total of 224.43. The, the 224 includes the extremely high priority and the high priority? Yes. Yes. Okay, and that's 224. At the low end. At the low end, yep. Thank you for helping us out with that, Jana. Martha? Yeah, I don't know, um, Jana, that's a good question. And the drawings that were submitted with the application, it's not clear um, if these are detailed construction drawings or not. Um, but that would be something that would be good to know because it's true that construction drawings could and specifications could cost a lot more money. Um, my, my impression was those were all done. And so what the designer <laughs> engineers would be doing then is to just be overseeing or absorbing the construction, which would be kind of the final phase of their work. But um, it's a good question. 
Sarah, do you have the budget in front of you? Are you able to help us out? Yeah, I'm trying to parse out what goes with what. While Sarah's doing that, any other, uh, Bev? Yeah, uh, just as Marcia was saying, the, the um, design and engineering fee equals about 10% of the rehab, which uh, would, given the small scope of the rehab, be about right in terms of oversight. I can't believe they designed it for that. Um, I wonder if we stop there. And I personally would suggest that we not be penny wise and pound foolish. If we think it's an important building and we'd like to see it uh, stand up there at its prominent location, what if we what if we say we'll we'll fund the uh, you could say we'll fund the 250, which is the high estimate for those costs. You guys reach into whatever pockets you have, find your engineering fees and go for it. Um, work on mass historic, et cetera. Um, gives them a little wiggle room in case their numbers are not right. Uh, but at least that work could proceed. Just a thought. So, so far I'm hearing uh, 165,000, 199,000, 224,000, 250,000 <laughs> worth 349,000. Hey, big spender. Well, the one thing we all know is that as we've been sitting here in this meeting, construction costs have been going up. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay, other comments? on this. So I'm hearing that most of us are in support of funding at some level. And the question is, what is that level? Uh, and again, to reiterate what um, Bev just said, I mean, we, we don't have to specify exactly what it is that they're doing. We come up with the amount and they, and they, they do what they, they do with it as long as it conforms to the historic preservation nature of the work. If there's people don't have other stuff to say, can someone make a motion suggesting a, an, an amount? And again, we, this is going into the shopping cart and we can revisit that amount later. Or Sarah, do you have anything you want to add to your, lo your looking over the budget? Yeah, and it's, it's impossible to parse out what the design and engineering fee is associated with. If it's you know, certain portions of the project, there may be pieces that are more costly than others. Um, so the the high end of the design and engineering is 44,358. In total. In total. Yeah. But if you look at it, it's 10% across the board at the subtotal level and then at the total total level. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, that's a much easier way to do it. <laughs> So if that's the case, 10% for the design fees, how about um, funding the high estimate for the high priority items, the three star items plus 10%? Sarah, can you add that up real quick? Cut the three star items plus 10%. I hear Martha making a proposal, right? That's what 46 and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah's doing that. Um, it, it it does sort of um, it's a little disconcerting that they don't have other sources of funding to maintain this building. I mean, I, just, um, I know that they've gone about the design of this in the right way. They have a very good architect, the structural engineers. Fabulous. Um, it looks like the Masons that are going to be doing the work are well qualified um, and very experienced. Um, but you know, the repairs aren't going to last forever. And you do kind of wonder like what what's the plan? Um, so that would be a message to send to them as well. And it's such an odd, I mean it's a wonderful building, but it's such an odd building. And inside, what would you do with it? I mean, could it be retail? I just don't see it. I mean, could it be served as, and, and so uh, do they need to be there to operate Smith Charities? Probably not, but 
what else would happen with that building. Uh, Chris? Well, I wanted to follow up with what Martha said because I I raised similar objections the last time that that they were here, which was that there was no that there was a a recognition on their part that there was a backlog of work that needed to be done. They weren't I I don't remember the exact figure, but um it was concluded that it was it was a sizable number. Um, and that um, uh, they didn't have a future revenue stream to support it. And um, I indicated at that point that I was wary of supporting future requests if there wasn't any sort of plan for how they were going to do that. Um, the plan that we got was... Um, the three phased repair plan, but that's not what I was actually looking for, which was a more comprehensive assessment of how they were going to manage these things as they went forward. And I, I, I on the fifty on the fifty thousand grant, uh, the other thing that stands out is that um, I don't know what Mass Historical's practices in the past on funding recurring recurring requests. But I do seem to remember that fifty thousand is like the max grant. Um, so you know, that's not that's that's a that's an uncertain short term funding source and a very dubious long term funding source. And uh, you know, I just um, I hear I hear I heard Julia's point about kicking the can down the road. Are we just create you know creating um, uh, a situation where they're going to be having repeated requests. And that's the one thing I want to try and avoid doing, but I'm also stuck between my concerns in that area. And also, you know, what, what do we do about this building? Um, Martha's comment about the position of the, uh, uh, you know, her other, her other, her, her other gang um, is, is, is at least somewhat compelling to me, but I don't, I don't know how we reconcile the two, which is maintaining this building and, and, and yet, avoiding becoming the sole source for maintenance into perpetuity. Jen, your hand was up before, is that right? Yeah, I was going to say almost the exact same thing. Um, and I also was wondering, um, I'm sure that we have this somewhere, but what ballpark dollar amount did we fund them at for last time and does anybody remember if we funded their full request last time Sarah do you have that yeah give me a second and I can pull that up but in the in the meantime uh the total for those three highest priority items plus the 10 percent for design and engineering would be 183,315 That's the sixth number that has been thrown out. <laughs> so 183,000. 183 would be the top priorities plus 10%. And now okay. you're searching for what we funded them in the in the past. Other discussion on this? Jack? I'm not sure if this is right, but is, is this the proposal? When it was made, they wanted to put an elevator up to the second floor on the outside. Is that this, this the same proposal that we? No, that was the uh, somebody else. That was the church, right? They are next to Smith College. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sure we didn't fund them fully the first time. Uh, Eighty-five thousand. What was the award um, from the? Previous repairs and then ten thousand prior to that for the historic uh, structures report, and I can pull up what was requested as well. Uh, other discussion on this one. Okay, would someone like to make a proposal? 
Again, we're going into the shopping cart. We can revisit it. Martha? I'll just repeat what I threw out before. Uh, I move that we support the highest priority items on their list at the um, high estimate level. So that would be chimney repair, cornice restoration, and limited roof and flashing repair, uh, plus 10% for design and engineering phase. And so and you're coming up with the 183 on that, is that correct? Correct. Um, and the committee did uh, recommend full funding as requested in the oh, previous application. For the prior one. Okay, so Martha's proposal is uh, 183,000 to fund the, the, the highest priorities plus 10% engineering. Is there a second on that? Second. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, Sarah. So this is the end of the shopping cart. All right, so roll call on the shopping cart for that item. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. All right, moving right along. Uh, third on the list, on uh, my list anyway, is uh, DAR. Some folks have an interesting site visit there. They've come up with a ask of 16,168 to replace the knob and two wiring. Sarah, I did know, note that in the um, council order, you called it knob and two wire, wire which sounds- It sounds a lot more fun. A lot more fun. And that, uh, so, um, and this is this is the the, the knob and tube wiring at sixty two thousand one hundred sixty eight, um, with a very long list of other items that are on their list. But this this was their top priority. Martha, can we put you on the spot again as you are a historic person? I can't speak for the commission because we didn't review this, um, but I think it was stated um, at the public comment period by Betty Sharp, who's one of the co-directors of um, Historic Northampton. This is a very important house. It um, dates to eight, around 1875, excuse me, 1753, twisted. Um, it's at a gateway to the city and that the um, DAR have been good stewards for, you know, over the years. I um, think that the presentation that was made on the 19th, it was made clear that they've worked on this a little by little, um, doing a lot of work on the interior as well as the <clears throat> roof. Um, so I, I think from my own interpretation of this, I think that this is a very important property. Um, it's very meaningful in the history of Northampton. And I think that the DAR have, have been good stewards. My only question about this, and um, I think this came up prior, is just uh, the limited um, public use of this property. I know that the DAR does make it available, but I, um, I don't know how extensive that actually is. And, um, it's not a museum. It's um, it's it serves a different function, and and we are committed as a um, an entity, you no, know, to serve the public. So that that would be my concern about it. But otherwise, I think it's very important. Um, it's very important the work needs to get done to mainly to save um, save this house from potential catastrophe. Thank you, Martha. Other folks? Jen? Thank you. Um, and thank you for that perspective, Martha. I, I mostly just had a question, um, which is just my own learning curve around historic preservation, but um, I can absolutely sort of see the argument of like repairing or upgrading knob and tube wiring will remove a huge risk from this historic structure, but 
the electrical system in and of itself in my brain isn't really a historic repair. Um, is that sort of acceptable as historic preservation because of the building that it's within? Um, does that is that question make sense? Sarah? Uh, so this is eligible under the CPA as a uh, code upgrade. So the, the wiring okay. that's in there now does not meet building code. So Great. it's not a, a strict um, historic preservation project on its own, but because the wiring is located within this larger building and the uh, upgrade of the wiring is necessary for modern code compliance, um, then that makes it eligible for the CPA. Great. Thank you so much. That was my question. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah um, this is more asking all of you who um, have lived in Northampton a long time and are more familiar with both both this organization. I don't want to take you back on the agenda, Mr. Chairman, but uh, Smith Charities, um, it's just a question for future. Um, I, I agree about the questionable public uh, use benefit of the building. And I also, as you were talking about um, whether or not either Smith or this group has a budget and funding to take care of the asset that they own, um, it, it, it strikes me that it, it is true for many organizations that they can reach the point where they really can't take care of themselves and where a higher and better way to preserve the historic resource might be to sell it. And so it is possible that we get into the space where we're putting off the inevitable. And I don't even know how to think about that. And maybe it's making everything too complicated <laughs> because in the, at the end of the day, 60 grand is not a lot of money and we'd all hate it if the building went up in flames. Uh, but how do we get at that issue of long-term viability in both cases? Um, and is it appropriate for us to ask for some sort of uh, plan <laughs> for, um, as someone said, why this isn't an annual uh, ask? Jen? Yeah, just to speak to that for this and the previous project, I think the lack of a match is kind of why that comes up for me. Like if there was, organizational investment or public investment that would speak a little bit more to sort of the the viability of the ownership structure over the longer term. And in general, in all of the projects that we look at a match, um, either public investment or some sort of organizational investment really speaks strongly to me as I'm considering projects. So it was, it was something I noted on this one. Chris? Um, I'm going to speak to a couple of different things. Uh, the first one is uh, with regard to the funding and, and match. The way it was explained to, to us on the site visit, and I can't remember if it came up during their presentation, um, the reason for the 100% the, the request had to do with the fact that uh, the work on the electrical had been scheduled, been, been done by uh, students at Smith Volk, who um, at the last minute, pulled the plug because of COVID concerns, they weren't gonna put them on site. So they found themselves two weeks before the deadline um, with an opportunity to come to us for, for funding, but no, probably not an adequate amount of time to flesh it out and certainly not um, time or to fundraise around it. Um, so I'm, I'm less concerned about that here. I'd be more concerned about it moving forward. Um, I get the sense that this is an organization that um, um, is looking for some direction as far as how they're going to manage this thing, and I think that they're 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 cognizant of the fact that um, uh, while they do do some things within the community, that 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 they that they they could do more, and I think that we can encourage them to do so. Um, I specifically said that you know they should consider doing outreach to both Historic Northampton and the Ruggles Center at, for cooperative um, uh, initiatives. And I think that there was that was receptive. Um, I'm gonna change hats for just a moment. Um, for those of you who don't me, 
don't know me, I'm a home inspector. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm a municipal employee. I'm a private inspector who does inspections on houses, properties that are usually um, being bought and sold. And uh, I had an opportunity to look at it. Um, and there's no question that the knob and tube is 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 problematic. And one of the points that was raised, and and this is a, is is has been my experience to be true. Um, in addition to the direct concerns about the condition of the wiring, um, there are a lot of contractors, particularly for things like insulation and that kind of thing, who, um, when they know about the presence of knob and tube, will not work there. So other things that they want to do for the property um, are precluded from occurring until the knob and tube issue is resolved. So, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm for for those reasons, I'm supportive of, of fully funding this. Um, my my only other thing would be a question of, um, do we need to do it now? Um, is it something where we can ask them to come back to us again um, with with a, 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 a more cohesive sort of strategic vision for use of the property, et cetera? Um, but, it's, but if somebody were to offer a motion to fully fund at this moment, I would strongly support it. Chris, can I ask you a quick question? As a building inspector, they came up with just one bid from one electrician for sixty-two thousand for the knob and tube and replacement. Does that seem reasonable to you? I can't speak to that. Um, I'm always concerned when there's only one bid, but I yeah. but I would I would reiterate what I said about the fact that they found themselves scrambling because they had a quote unquote contractor in place, um, and uh, and and. Um, uh, when that evaporated, I think that they they um, they took what they had available to them and used that as the basis for their proposal. But that's one of the other reasons why I'm I I think you know uh, if it's if it's uh, if it's reasonable to get you know to delay it and and have them get a couple more estimates. And it's also possible. I don't know if this is true or not, but theoretically, it's possible that Smith Vogue might be online at some point in the future. But having said that. You know, I think it's I think it's a, I think you can legitimately make the argument both for the safety of the building and for um, their need to to move forward in other areas that uh, the knob and tube does get does need to get done. Other comments? Sarah, we can ask that they give get a couple of other bids. Is that correct? Yeah, we could we could request that. I think um, it, as Chris mentioned earlier, there was a little bit of a, a time crunch with this application, but may have been something that they would have planned on doing otherwise if had had Smith Vogue not pulled out uh, right before the grant was due. And we could ask if they could perhaps re-engage Smith Vogue with some of the restrictions being lifted around COVID. Any other discussion on this one? Is there a motion? I would move to fund the project in full. Uh, Jeff? Have you muted? What a day, sorry. Um, I second the motion and I do think they intend to open the building more to the public. I, I seem to recall when we visited, there was discussion about um, more of a public open house as well as, a, as another group that was going to be coming in, but I think they were sensitive to, um, like Chris mentioned, working with the Ruggles Center um, to expand the public outreach. So, um, and I, I was, I mean, they have original timbers in the attic. When we were in the attic, the original timbers are there. Um, it, it was unbelievable um, to me. And I don't, I, I'm worried about something going wrong. So I support the motion. Okay. Uh, without further discussion, the motion is to approve full funding of $63,168 for the uh, Navin tube wiring 
Uh, Sarah, well, this is going into the shopping cart. Uh, Sarah? Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. Uh, how about we try to make it through the uh, Northampton Music Center with Jason perhaps still there uh, and then take a little break. Does that is that workable for folks? We can do that and then we'll discuss how to move on. So moving on to the Music Center with their ask of $220,000. Um, we funded them once before. This is our second round of funding. Uh, since they were since we funded them before, they have now purchased the building. I think when we first funded them, Sarah, am I correct? The building was owned by the city, and now they have um, they have fully funded themselves, and we fully purchased the building. So one thing we could talk about as we discuss this is whether or not a condition on approval would be to get a historic preservation restriction. So Martha will throw it back in the air court. Sorry to put you on the spot every time, but that's what comes with, with your expertise. Your thoughts? Yes. Um, again, the commission did review this. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about um, just replacing windows and doors and whether they would be compliant with the Secretary of the Interior standards. And I think after a, quite a bit of a go around, um, the commission felt supportive. Sarah, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. That's my memory, it was a while ago. Um, and so again, from my point of view, um, I, I, I have to say I was really um, swayed and also really impressed by the outpouring of support for this. Um, the commentary that was delivered by all the people that um, came uh, young and old. Um, there was an older woman who spoke up about the loneliness she experienced during COVID, um, being a senior, and all she had to do was um, focus on her grandkids, and she, that was just not enough. And she went to the community medic center, and they made all these accommodations for older people. And I just thought that was fabulous. Um, so, and then also that it's such a um, important um, institution in that neighborhood, that South Street neighborhood. And they talked about that. And I, I was really impressed by that. And um, they did a great job of bringing people out for it. Um, and I just know it's touched a lot of families and children who, you know, grown up to be musicians. Um, so I think, and, and also I really respect the fact that they have, um, it, you know, dedicated themselves to bringing this building back, which is kind of derelict uh, when they acquired it. Um, it's a again a very important building. Um, it was inventoried as part of the, the inventory of historic resources in Northampton, and identified as eligible possibly for the National Register. So I guess um, I think with the work that's being done, I think it's been um, very thoughtfully um, considered, and I would um, support this. Martha, would you support a condition being a historic preservation restriction on the building? Oh. Um, Yes, I definitely would do that because it's a sizable amount of money. And I don't think this um, organization has any intent of selling this building anytime soon. So, yeah, I would definitely support that. Other discussion on this? I think this is a different uh, organization, obviously, than. Smith Charities or DAR, and they're contributing a lot um, to this project. I think the total project is coming in at, I don't have it in front of me, 350 or something, or 360,000. And the Astos is two thirds or maybe a little less than that. So it's nice to see they're getting support from members and uh, in the community and all that stuff. And like Martha said, I was very impressed by the number of folks who showed up at the public comment. Uh, with moving testimony to the power of music and the power of the music center in their, in their lives. So other discussion on this one. Okay. 
Okay, someone like to make a motion? Um, Brett, I'll just add before the motion that it, if the committee does decide to recommend this to council, I'm not sure that this would meet mass historics requirements for a permanent preservation restriction um, because there has been some alteration to the building and some of the elements that um, NCMC might be thinking about changing going forward. Um, mass historic might want to put some additional restrictions on. So it, if that's a requirement of the order, you might want to frame it either way so that it could either be a permanent preservation restriction held by mass historic or just a local restriction valid for 30 years. Uh, Martha, how do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. I think the latter is probably the better approach. Um, you know, this is a or this is was built as a school, um, an elementary school, I believe, and you know, it's serving a related but very different function now. Um, and I think it's going to continue to have um, growing needs, and I think we need to be able to accommodate that. So rehabilitation of the building. And if there's a danger that Mass Historic would be um, keeping from the organization back from doing that, um, I don't think that we should get involved in that. But holding a 30 years, I think, warranted. So can you state the condition again, Sarah or Martha? Uh, so just to provide some flexibility so that the restriction either be a, a permanent uh, Mass General Laws historic preservation restriction or a local historic preservation restriction. Um, and because those aren't signed off on by the state, they're valid for a maximum of 30 years. Okay. Beth? I was just going to wholeheartedly uh, uh, move that we approve funding for this project and I'll leave it to others to state the condition <laughs> that that just was commented. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to fully fund the uh, Northampton Community's Music Center to the tune of 200 uh, to the tune. Do you get that? Uh, <laughs> not knob and tune. To the knob and tune of 220000 <laughs> Uh, uh, Sarah, take us through. Uh... All right. Uh, Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? I couldn't unmute. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, it is 8.40. Uh, I don't know about other folks, but I could use a little bathroom break. Is that okay? Uh, try to come back in seven or eight minutes. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, so we will see you in just a few minutes.
Okay, hopefully that was helpful for folks. Um, we have uh, an opportunity to um, not go through all eight of these and to meet again in two weeks, but I would suggest that we see how it goes in the next 45 minutes or an hour or so and see if we can hang in there. Does that make sense to folks? Yes? Okay, great. Um, I'm always amazed at how wonderful this committee is and how thoughtful people and articulate people are and committed to the goals, not just of the Community Preservation Act, but to our city as well. So let's move right along to, um, how about let's, let's tackle the one, two, three, four, is it left of the affordable housing stuff and start with um, perhaps Habitat for Humanity, which is coming back to us. We funded them numerous times, this time for 180,000 for the three units uh, up on um, 66. Uh, discussion on the Habitat for Humanity proposal. Anybody wanna discuss this? Uh, Jeff? Um, I support the proposal. Um, we funded them several times during um, my tenure. Um, they do excellent work. Um, we need this desperately. Um, I think it's consistent with the other proposals we have received um, in the past, and I support it, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jeff. Other comments? Hard to imagine how people could do any more with the amount of money that that they that they budget for these units is it's pretty amazing. Martha? Yes, I agree. And I agree with what Jeff said also. And I just wanted to say um I have been running by that prop those properties for so many years and watching them just deteriorate and deteriorate and deteriorate. And I'm gonna be so glad to see something um go in there to um just improve that area. And I also wanted to just uh um bring up the point that when i remember at the public um session uh, a neighbor uh, i think who lives across the street from these properties spoke up and said he was also too delighted that the improvement was going to be made and i thought that was really meaningful but i support it jonah i just wanted to say i i totally agree with martha and supporting this wholeheartedly and particularly because i just uh uh, the folks that are going to live in those houses are going to have one of the most beautiful views in all of Northampton, and I feel so excited that that would go to Habitat for, for Humanity clients. Anybody else on this? Okay, is there a motion? Let's put it in the shopping cart at 180, full fund. A second? I second. Sarah? Great. So roll call vote for this one. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous. All right, let's stick with the affordable housing theme and look at the downtown uh, affordable housing project. That's the one right next to City Hall on those stairs going down. Uh, this is for $60,000. Discussion on this. Uh, Sarah, how just just to give us a little background, how far along are they in 
and getting money and all that stuff. How far along are you, I suppose? Uh, so the city has received a municipal vulnerability program grant for this project, and it's in design stages at the moment. And how much was that grant for? Oh, it's indicated in the application. It was a significant amount. Um, 921,000 and change. No, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, do you want to speak to this as a housing person? I support the proposal and, uh, in part because <clears throat> um, it's right downtown um, where it's most needed. And they do have a grant. It's 921,300 um, already received and um they're only asking us for um sixty thousand dollars which is 4.7 percent of the project so um i think it's very affordable jonah i i was just going to say that aside from the worthwhile goal of uh very low income housing units i i feel excited about this project from an urban design perspective and that that Placing a building mass in that spot will just have, have a really nice impact on, dare I say, the, the slightly urban feel that we have downtown and fill out what, what feels like a kind of hole in the street mass. So I feel excited about it for that reason as well. Martha? Uh, I echo everything and also what Jonah said, and also just uh, I'm going to be so glad to see that horrible, brutalist, concrete pile of steps go away that are so dangerous that, yay. Beth? Yeah, this is just a question I'm guessing for Sarah. Um, so as I understand it, the city is going to lead a design process and come up with a design for the building and then do an R RFP for a developer. Is that what how it works? Uh, so it it's in in the initial stages currently. Um, yeah. The the ultimate goal is to have it ready to transfer to a developer who will then take over the project. But the city will be heavily involved in the design and the public outreach process. Yeah, I, as I said, I'm just curious. My my experience with uh, city led design processes, and this is no commentary on you or anyone else involved is that it usually leads to two chapters. One, a design and a cost that the city blesses and then the real deal. So I'm just trying to understand how far you take it what before you hand it off. I mean, so a lot of it is people with a lot of opinions about this. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is due diligence to see from an engineering perspective what the site will be able to handle. Um, so a, a lot, it'll be heavy on engineering and and okay. a little bit less so on on actual design or, and what it will look like. More about feasibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I uh, I am thrilled with this project. I I, I love it. Uh, just trying to understand the way things work. Thank you. Other comments, questions. Good to go. Sarah? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, motion for the downtown affordable housing project. Move to fund for $60,000 and place in the shopping cart. Second? Second. Thank you. Sarah? All right, so roll call. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Unanimous. Boy, that bathroom break worked wonders. We are on a roll <laughs> now. Yeah, here we go. Uh, um, <laughs> next one is Leeds Affordable Housing, our smallest uh, project, a 20,000 ask to do the due diligence there, um, up in the pretty much the center of that section of Leeds. Uh, comments, questions, discussion on the Leeds project. Is it that it's late or is that we are just 
pretty much made up our minds. Joan. Uh, I just wanted to say that to me, this is just such a tiny lot so far out and uh, could barely fit a house on it. Uh, and um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what all the alternative would be that maybe the city would be better off selling it to one of the abutting landowners if that's possible and using the revenue for something else. Um, seems like a, like a stretch to me, but, but uh, I would go along if everyone else feels in support. Sarah, it meets all the requirements for placement of a unit, is that correct? It, it is just barely too small to be a full building lot, but there is a provision, like really just barely, like a 150 square feet or something like that. Um, but there is a provision in the zoning that allows for some reductions uh, if an affordable unit is created, which is what the city would be pursuing here. I'm sorry, it was the, the, the lot itself, the how the the uh, footprint itself would be 150 square feet? And it's about 150 square feet uh, too small to be considered a, a building lot for all purposes. Uh, but yeah. because the, the city would be pursuing affordable housing or or any developer, there's a provision in the zoning that allows for some reductions to be able to take place. I'm sorry, what does a reduction mean? Uh, so a, a, a lot size reduction. Um, so it, there are there's some flexibility in the zoning if affordable housing is being created, uh, so that frontage or or area requirements don't need to be strictly met. Okay. Other discussion on this. Uh, forgive my memory lapse, Sarah. Um, what's this twenty thousand four again? Uh, so this is additional due diligence. It's similar to the affordable housing fund, but was called out as a separate project because um, Carolyn had identified that these would be costs that would go directly towards this project and wanted to be really transparent about that. <laughs> Thank you. Further discussion? Is there a motion? Move to fund. Thank you, Chris. Second? Second. Thank you, Jeff. Sarah? Thanks. Roll call. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous. Okay, last but not least in our affordable housing proposals is the affordable, <clears throat> excuse me, the affordable housing fund. Uh, once again, coming from the city, the ask is for 50,000. We, for um, Bev and Jonah's sake, we funded this numerous times before. And I think um, it was it was put what some of those soft costs are and, and how this is a real real uh, tool in the city's tool chest to get at some of these soft costs and these small costs without coming back with real, with with really little stuff. So we funded this on numerous occasions. Uh, Beth? Yeah, I think it's great. I um, just presume that the city's done this enough times, they know how much they need. Seems like a small ask, but. What what we've done in the past, uh, Bev and Jonah, with both the Affordable Housing Fund as well as the Conservation Fund, is just to sort of fund at a level and then they begin to knock it off. And then when they are done and spent it all, then they come back and ask. Uh, so, uh, and. I know the conservation fund, we funded it numerous, numerous times. And I can't remember how much we've done with the affordable housing fund, but yeah. Other discussion on this? Jen? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm in support of this um, and sort of 
to speak to both this and the conservation fund having I worked for a land trust for six years and did conservation deals and this kind of due diligence, which I assume is very similar in affordable housing is critical and very hard to fund otherwise. But because of the timeliness of deals like this, when you're dealing with people and their lives and their situations is often very timely and can be the difference between a deal happening or not happening. And so having that flexibility and the money there for them to use um, can really create more opportunity for affordable housing and conservation in my mind. So I'm strongly in support of it. Any further discussion on this? Okay, is there a motion? Pat? Sure, I'll make a motion to put it in the cart. At 20,000? At 25, yep. I'm sorry, at, at, at 50,000. 50, 50, I was just looking at it, yeah. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah? Sarah, you're muted. Uh, Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. <clears throat> Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Yes. Uh, Chris? Yes. Julia? Uh, Julia? Oh, she's she's nodding. I see her. Uh, oh, Beth? Okay. <laughs> yes. And Brian? Yes. Unanimous. All right. Well, um, Jen brought up the similarities between this and the conservation fund. We have four proposals left. I think we're going to be able to make our way through these four conservation, conservation related proposals. So let's start with the conservation fund because the similarities there to what we just dealt with, with the affordable housing fund. Uh, the ask from the city is for 50,000. Uh, we are presented with some of the many different projects. Again, for uh, Bev and Jonah's sake, Anything that comes in over 10,000 as a sort of hard cost there comes to us and is not funded within this with this fund. So it's more for these soft costs and all the due diligence that goes around uh, city conservation proposals. Uh, discussion on the 50,000 for the conservation fund. Jen? Yeah, I won't repeat myself all the things I said before. Um, the thing I forgot to mention, and I presume we can put into an order once we get to final votes, is there is sort of this tension of these sort of vague funds where we are just giving a pot of money versus that flexibility and ability to act quickly on opportunities that I was mentioning. And an idea that came up when we were discussing it originally was just to get an accounting from the city for both of these funds um, for future grant proposals of this is what we spent the last $50,000 on. And I think for this and for the other, um, for the affordable housing one, that would be really helpful. And I think might satisfy some of those concerns about kind of the bucket of money concern that I heard from other commissioners. And I think that was done this time, wasn't it? Did she present that to us? So that was that was nice to see. Chris? No, I, I just want to thank uh, Jen for bringing that up. And and yes, you know, that's something that um, was one of my original concerns when I joined the CPC was creating pots of undesignated funds, which, you know, I, I use the phrase slush funds. I don't like them. Uh, but um, over time, the 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 the, the city has has demonstrated that they have been responsive to our concerns and and um, wise in their wise in their allocation of the funds. So I'm I'm happy to support them. Other discussion on the conservation fund. Okay, can someone make a proposal? A motion. 
Sure, I'll make a motion to fully fund. I think it's $50,000, right? It is. Second? Second. Sarah? Okay. Uh, so roll call. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Just nodding again. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I can't get my mute on. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, Beth? <laughs> yes. And Brian? Yes. Right, unanimous. Okay, let's move in right along. Uh, let's do our big ask here, which is the Sawmill Hills core, which is 200 and I'm forgetting. How many acres is it? 229? Uh, is that right? 229 acres? Yes. Uh, for those of you who may remember from our last meeting, the 400,000 land grant came in, hoorah. Uh, so that that is in, the ask from us is, uh, for 300,000 um, discussion on that. Uh, Jen, you want to talk about that? I don't know that I have anything particular to say other than I know that the process for getting land grants is very competitive. So that speaks very highly to the quality of this project. And it speaks very high to the quality of our asks because we continue to get these land grant um, funded proposals funded year after year. It's really quite stunning how much money we brought in through that. So thanks to the to Sarah and the folks in the Office of Planning and Sustainability for making that happen. Other discussion? Is there a motion? I'll move to fund in full. A second? Second. Okay, a couple of seconds there. I think Jonah and Julie. Uh, Sarah? All right, so roll call vote. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous. All right, folks, we got two more projects. And then we start to wheel our way to the checkout counter. Uh, let's look at the Connecticut River multi use trail. Um, that's the one right next to the never ending, the Damon Road construction. Is that what that is? That seems to have been going on for what, seven years, eight years? And just when they pave one part, they dig it up and start to pave it again. So <laughs> there we go. Maybe we should have just turned that into a trail and closed it down to vehicles. Uh, discussion on this. Martha. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, sir. I just, uh, if you're there, I just had a question. I know that the whole Hatfield connection um, was hanging. Is there been any more resolution to that since uh, Carolyn presented? You're muted. Sorry, I had to run and get a charger. Sorry, my computer was. <laughs> okay. um, so not since Carolyn presented. No, I had. Uh, there are groups on opposing sides in Hatfield. Some people really want it. They want it. They've wanted it for years and are really pushing for it. Um, there's some reservations about parking and access and, you know, the typical complaints that people might have about a potential path where there hadn't been one, you know, crime and additional use. Um, so Hatfield has not resolved those yet, but the general feeling is that even if Hatfield does not want to connect to the network, and doesn't want to be part of the project, this will still be a, a really spectacular trail along the Connecticut River. Yeah, clearly. Okay. But it's going to dead end, kind of, it would dead end. But maybe yeah. they come around in the long yeah. run. Yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully, even if Hatfield doesn't want to join at this point, that could change at some point in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was just a question. Julia? 
Uh, we talked about this at Parks and Rec, and we absolutely support this, whether it dead ends or not. It promotes active transport and recreation and provides access to an area that people otherwise have a really hard time walking into to see the Connecticut River. Great. Uh, other discussion of this? So this is a uh, 40,000 ask, is that right? Is that right? Yes. Any further discussion? Okay, is there a motion? I move to fund in full or put in the shopping cart for full funding. Thank you, Janet. Second? Second. A couple seconds. Uh, Sarah? You're muted. Sarah, you're mute. you are muted. Sorry, right, I'm all discombobulated because I hit the plug my computer. I'm sorry, I'm all set now. Uh, so roll call vote on this one. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Unanimous. I'm in, in a permanent state of discombobulation. Such a good word. Uh, last but certainly not least is the Rocky Hill Greenway, the new bike path or multi-use trail extending from 66 to Route 10, uh, coming in at uh, 60,000 is the ask, right? Discussion on this. Sarah, just a clarification, the federal money is there, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, it, it just needed an additional boost to get it to the construction stage, but the money has been earmarked and is available for use. So once our 60,000 comes in for the final design work, then construction costs are taken care of. Correct. Julia? Uh, same as that other project discussed at, um... Parks and Rec, and again, supported for the same reasons, uh, recreation, active transport. This is especially a uh, great connection on the active transport issue and uh, uh, brings together a nice part of our trails in Northampton. Thank you, Julia. Other discussion? Okay, is there a motion? I'm, I'm the part for 60. So moved. Okay. I think Bev and Jonah on a second, or Jonah on a first and Bev on a second. Uh, Sarah? All right. Roll call. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Unanimous. All right, folks, we are moving right along. So we have 11 items in our shopping cart. The Community Investment Fund, we did not put in. We moved that to recommending that it not be funded, but that they uh, redo their proposal. And uh, while we're positive about it, they would ask, requesting that they resubmit. The Smith Charities we funded, in the, or at least we put into the shopping cart at 183,000. Um, the, all the others were funded uh, fully. Uh, one condition was with the music center, which was the historic preservation restrictions that, that were set to that. To my knowledge, we have no other conditions set forth at this time. So I think we might want to talk about that if there are other conditions. Uh, Chris? Uh, just before we get started, if you can, um, Sarah, you got a back of the envelope of where we are total wise. And before you do that, on the 183 for um, Smith, Smith Charities, Charities, I just want to make sure 
Um, Martha said high end estimate plus 10 percent. And I want to make sure that we didn't do low end estimate plus 10 percent. I intended to do the highest, so let me just double check. Then I trust you. Thank you. All right. um, for what it's worth, I came to the same conclusion. Oh. All right, excellent. And, um, and Chris, I did the math. It's like <coughs> 1.2 now. 1.23, 1, 2, 3, Excellent, 0. thank you. Eight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, one, it's 183 and it's more, it's 183 and change, right, Sarah? It was, yeah. Okay. What is it? Do you know the exact? Yes. It was. Julia, can you? Uh, 183,315. Okay. Okay. Julia, <laughs> can you come up with a figure that you just said in terms of what was it? 123483. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, so again, and, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, the, the only condition that I remember is the Music Center one uh, requiring a historic preservation. There was a couple of choices there. Um, other than that, I don't think we had conditions that we were setting for any of the, uh, any of the other ones. Um, are there conditions out there if we're gonna move these to the checkout or check these out that we want to set on any of these uh, proposals. Is that a no? Or we are we comfortable with it as as they are? Yes. Okay. It seems like we remember how to do this every time. Um, I think we can take a vote now as we check out on all 11 of these together rather than going through each one. Uh, is, that, is that right? We've it, done it that depended before. on preference in the past. Uh, some people wanted to vote on them individually so that they weren't re all reflected as unanimous. Um, okay. It, it's committee's pleasure. So all of these were unanimous that are in the shopping cart, is that correct? The one that was not unanimous was the unanimous was the community investment fund. Correct. And that's not in the shopping cart. So these 11 were um, just thumbs up with, with voting on them as in, in, in the cart itself as one vote. Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. We are officially checking out at 1,230,483 for 11 proposals to join the other three that we have already funded, which would put us up somewhere around, uh, you know, getting into the, you know, what's uh, 500, uh, whatever it is that we funded for. Uh, so Sarah, you're gonna take us through a roll call on this. Did we, uh, did we have a motion? Oh yes, thank you, motion. I can move that um, we fund uh, the 11 proposals that are in the shopping cart at the levels that have been stated. Um, Thank you, Martha. Second? Second. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Sarah. All right, so roll call vote. Jen? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. Martha? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Beth? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Okay, you're now Hoorah. Um, now it's, it's 923, but if we could, Sarah, you want from us a quick look at the uh, council orders is I, that correct it's up to you i if if you want to sit on these and and digest the fine tuning of it until um two weeks from now and maybe have a quick meeting that would be fine if you're comfortable moving through the orders now we could do that um these aren't going to be going to council until january either way so 
I mean, I, I had three incredibly nitpicking things, including a semicolon, weird font, and the knob and tune, which I like better than knob and tune. But other than that, I mean, I just wordsmithed them and didn't didn't see a thing. Uh, the Victoria Bismarck, uh, the um, Habitat one, Birds Pit Road was in weird, came out in weird font. There's something wrong with the the way that order is set up. That will be. That'll go away. Um, okay. In this reformat. In the music the school, the second where I asked, needed a semicolon. Who cares, right? And then again, the knob and tube for the DAR. Um, did other folks have a chance to look at the council orders and have comments on them? Uh, we'll revise the uh, Northampton Community Music Center order. D does the order include the conditions, Sarah, or is that? So the specific conditions of each project, you know, if it's something major enough that uh, the committee wanted it in the record of the city council vote, then that's something that could be included in the order. If it's something that requires a separate city council action, like an acquisition of a real property interest, as, as would be the case with the preservation restriction, then that would have to be included. Um, but otherwise, it's it's sort of a matter of preference. Some of the more detailed conditions can be addressed in the contracts themselves. Uh, what do folks think about this? Should we put it in the council order as a condition of funding to require a... Did, did you have a chance to talk to Jason about this, sir? I did. So I, I had a meeting um, earlier today with Jason and Jonathan Wright just to talk about the sort of the, the nitty gritty details of what a preservation restriction is and what that might look like. And they agreed that that seemed like something that they would feel comfortable putting before their board and, and accepting. But they also understood that it would be a condition of the funding if that's something that the committee required and they would just have to deal with it one way or the other. Okay. Do we want to put that in the, in, I, I would feel more comfortable having it in the um city council orders yeah this one would have to be because the the city would be accepting a real property interest and city council does need to approve that so if we didn't okay. include it here we would have to go back and do it separately which isn't okay helpful. so we can include it in, in this. Yeah. and um we and we would need to change that language to be an, an either or uh scenario with the type of restriction okay are folks comfortable with that and not not needing any additional are not adding any other additional conditions onto these city council orders. All right. Hurrah for us, right? Yeah. Um, so Sarah, I'm not quite sure we will need to meet again in December, will we? Um, if you are, if you're willing to approve the, the orders as written, um, and trusting me to fine tune the accounts and correct those minor typos, and no, I, I, we should be good. Is, is there a motion necessary to approve city council orders? Yes. Okay. And you can, can do them do all them as a batch if you want to. You know, as a batch. So we have Move eleven city approve. council orders. I'm sorry. Move to approve. Thank you, Chris. Second. Second. Sarah. All right. <laughs> Roll call on all of those, Jen. Yes. Jonah? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jana? Yes. I put all these J's together. It's going to be a tongue twister. Martha? Uh, yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Brian? Yes. Okay, unanimous. All right. Uh, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? All right, folks, we have done our work and we've done it well. And I thank all of you for your work done well. And uh, unless we hear from Sarah, we will not be meeting again until the end of January. Is that correct? Uh, the first meeting, I'll send out a schedule, but the first meeting will likely be February. Not till February. Maybe. Uh, um, so either end of January or early February. Great. So uh, have a wonderful rest of the 2022 and we will see you in, oh, hold on, Joe's got something to say.
John? Uh, I simply wanted to say that I, I thought that you had said that we were going to potentially start meeting in person come January or February. Did I misunderstand that? Or is that something? Sarah? Yes. I uh, completely up to the committee. There, there's no requirement either way at this point. If you're comfortable meeting in person and that's what you prefer, then we could do that. If you'd prefer to continue meeting on Zoom, we could do that as well. Is that something we'd think about and bring up at a Zoom meet, a, a first Zoom meeting and discuss how to proceed? Is that okay with you, Jonah? Yeah. Okay, so we'll meet, plan on meeting with, by Zoom the first, uh, first meeting the end of January, early February, and then decide, and that can be on the agenda, sir. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. Good. All right, I folks. I want to say thank you, Brian, for your, your enlightened leadership through the process. As always, yeah. it's a pleasure working my, with my you. My discombobulated leadership. Call it what you will. My, my knob and tune leadership. It works. <laughs> it works. You pulled us through this one, Brian, in record time. I thought we'd be here all night. So. I did too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, everybody. See ya. Thank you. Happy Thanks, holidays. Everyone. Happy holidays.